Look at chapter 8 in the book of Romans. I guess you could put a title on the whole chapter by saying that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And uh, it shares so many wonderful insights in this passage of Scripture. And the title of the message, We Are God's Workmanship. And the idea is that God loves us and cares for us. Even when we mess up and do maybe the wrong thing, God does not throw us under the bus, but he keeps us close to his heart. I want to read the scripture to you from Romans chapter 8, what we're looking at today, beginning in verse 26. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation, which is more acclimated to our language today as we understand it instead of the King's English. Verse 26 reads as follows. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses or infirmities. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all our hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him, And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. I mean, no question that God is for us, not against us. No question that God continually gives unto us over and over and over and over. Sometimes we don't even realize it. And I imagine when we step into his holy presence in eternity, a lot of things will come to our mind and we'll begin to see how this great puzzle that was fragmented was put together and how God brings everything together according to his good will and purpose. You see, when you come to Jesus, there's a process that begins in our lives. It's called sanctification, which is theological term meaning being set apart unto God. And in that process, he is working in our hearts to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ, because God is family-oriented. God wants many sons and many daughters. And so he's working in your heart and life, even at times when we might question God and say, God, where are you in all the things I'm contending with? And sometimes believers think that God has forsaken them. But the Bible tells us he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We have to not make judgment calls based on our emotions, but what the Word of God says. That is the truth. And sometimes we get confused because maybe we're praying and things aren't working out like we thought they would work out. But that's why he gives us the Holy Spirit who leads and guides. And even when we're goofing up and don't even know how to pray, the Holy Spirit will be praying for us according to the will of the Father, which will bring about the best thing. He said, I, you know, we talk about prayer meetings, but talking about how the Holy Spirit intercedes in our behalf for the presence of the Father. Some of those things, it's hard for us to put our head around to figure it out, but the Word tells me that God does intercede for us. I mean, he, He's got a plan and purpose. He started this whole thing in your heart and life. He's going to bring it to fruition. Amen? So, when I look here at the time when you came to Jesus, when I came to Jesus, and how God takes us on this spiritual journey in our life, if we live 50 years, 60, 70, 80, 90, whatever, and how God will accomplish things in our lifetime, even when I we step into eternity. I think still God has 
many things planned and established for us. We just get a glimpse of it here, just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. So when I read this scripture, I just want to point out the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, and essentially four things. I'm just going to mention those, and then we'll come back and examine them. It says, the Spirit of God helps us with our weaknesses or our infirmities. Another thing, the Spirit of God causes everything in our life to work out for good. Third thing, the Spirit of God is conforming us unto the image or the likeness of Jesus Christ. And finally, the Spirit of God will bring completion and glorification in our lives at the end of history. Now, that's a whole lot of stuff right there. And when we begin to read the Scriptures and then meditate on the Word of God and begin to listen to God and, and how He just is a great conductor orchestrating things. You know, it's amazing that God has a personal, intimate relationship with me, you, and millions of other people, and it's working. I mean, how do you, how do, you do that? Only God can do that. And the first thing I see here is how God helps us with our weaknesses, our infirmities. It could be physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, whatever we're contending with in our own lives. And the amazing thing is the Holy Spirit intercedes with us according to the will of God to bring about what he has planned and purposed in our hearts and lives. Have you ever been in a situation where you're just overwhelmed by the events that take place and all of a sudden disaster hits your life, your family, you deal with a broken heart, someone hurts you, betrays you, and all of a sudden you feel like you're just been cast aside. And maybe it could be financial, it could be physical, it could be a relationship with another person. I think at some point in time, everybody here has dealt with a broken heart. Where you thought that you were accepted, you were loved, and then found out otherwise. I'm known as young people, and even older people where their heart was broken to the point where they despair so greatly that they take their life. And that's not of God. That's how the enemy comes and attacks. But when you find yourself in that drama and that you don't even know how to vocalize or pray or, and you call out to God for help, he's not forgotten you. It's a spiritual thing when he'll come through the power of the Holy Ghost and pray for you. That's one thing I appreciate about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the gift of speaking in tongues. And one of those beautiful things is the Holy Spirit will intercede in your behalf and pray for you. And all you can do is just lift your hands and just cry out to God for mercy. God, help me. I am hurting. I can't make any sense out of this. I call unto you, O oh God. Uh, not trying to outdo this experience in my life, but when I lost my son, I remember going up into North Georgia and finding a river and just got in that river and just walking upstream. I wasn't fearful of drowning, I knew how to swim, it wasn't that dangerous. But nobody was there, and I was just saying, God, I just need to know that you got me in this place. I am hurting. And just from the bottom, the depths of my bosom, I just cried out to God, cried out to God, lifted my hands, and just as loud as I could asked for God, Lord, help me. Come near me, Lord. I am in pain. I'm suffering. I'm hurting. God, help me to get through this. The best thing that happened to me at that time 
was I knew that my faith in God was real. It was more than just a confession or a declaration. But now I could sense God coming and holding me and consoling me when I couldn't get that from anyone else. Not that other people didn't care, didn't pray for me. But I'm sure you've been to that place where you've lost a loved one. Where all of a sudden your world, world was turned upside down. I'm doing a funeral uh, tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock. And talk with the surviving members of that family. And their loved one was suddenly taken just like that. They didn't even have a warning. And they're hurting deep down in their heart and mind. And they can't just put their hands and head around this thing. And I'll console them and say, there's a God who loves you and cares for you. It says in the 23rd Psalm, he'll walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. And his rod and his staff will comfort you. You have a choice at that time in your life. And the best thing to do is to move towards God. Unfortunately, people move away from God and become bitter and resentful and blame God. And they'll say things like this. Well, God, if you're all powerful and you're good, nothing is beyond your grasp, then why didn't you intervene and stop this? Why didn't you deliver? Why didn't you heal? Why, God, why? And I, one thing that I understand, there's an appointed time unto everyone, they're going to depart from this world. And the best thing that you and I can do in regards to our own life is listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And when he invites you to become a member of his family, you don't say no, you say yes. Because at one point in time, everybody here is going to have to deal with the last enemy that we have on this planet called death. And if you come to Jesus and know Jesus, and I tell people this, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And that he will give us that security and that peace when we can step from this life into real life that we know that he's got us. And that's true. That's why I desire to see everyone I know to come to, to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus. And I'm sure you want the same thing. Thank God, when he ascended into the heavens, Jesus said, I'm going to send the paraclete, the Holy Ghost, and he'll come. He'll not take residence in a building, a brick and mortar in the Middle East, but he's going to live right smack dab in you. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. Amen? Live in you that you can contend with anything in your life. And he'll come along beside you when you don't even know how to voice your prayer and your hurt and pain unto God. And the Holy Ghost will come and he will be there to help you. And what I'll do, I just lift my hands, I'll just pray in the Spirit, pray in tongues, a pure, holy prayer unto God who knows me better than I know myself and speak in and through me. And he'll come and shore you up and strengthen you and give you hope beyond the grave. Glory to God. Amen? The second thing it says here about we are God's workmanship. The Spirit of God causes everything in your life to work for good to those who love God and call according to his purpose. What? You mean everything? Is that what the Bible says? I thought maybe I said just a few things or maybe half of the things in your life will work out for good. Is there anything in your life that's not worked out for good? Yeah, at least I thought. You know what we need to be careful? When we're in the midst of a situation, 
beginning point and the end point, we don't get halfway through and make a judgment call. God, where are you? I thought you said all things work together for good. I don't see any good at, in this situation. This is a disaster. I don't see how this is going to work out. How's this going to be a blessing to me? You have to go back to what God's Word says, not what our opinion is or what our thoughts are. What does the Word of God say? All things work together for good to those conditions. You got to love God. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. It explains the condition that things work together for good to those who love God. What about those who don't love God? What about those people? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22 says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Anathema. What does that word mean? A curse. Not that God is out trying to hurt people, but when a person says to God, you know what, you give me free will, and you want me to bend my knee, you want me to confess with my, with my mouth, you want me to give my life to you, ah, I want my life. I'll keep my life and do my own thing. You know, God, maybe some other day, but the answer today is no. I don't want you messing with my life. I don't want to surrender my life to you. A person who is separated from God that says spiritually, biblically, they're dead in their sins and trespasses. They're not alive. You know, they're functioning as a human being, maybe doing well, as the world would say. But there's no indication that they have surrendered their life to Jesus. And so the consequences of saying no to God Day after day, year after year, and finally to the end of their life, or they pass on to eternity, and they have rejected the witnessing power of the Holy Ghost. There's no more sacrifice for sins for them. They will suffer, unfortunately, their wrath to God. But God's will is that none would perish, but all come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus. But God loves us so much that he gives us a free will and gives you the power to say no. I don't want to say no to God. Never. Do you? I always want to say yes. Yes. God, you work your will and purpose. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Well, how did this dynamic work out? How, how does all things work together for good to those who love God? If you love God, you'll do a John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. One way you demonstrate your love for God, you obey him. Amen? You know, some people take and just whitewash that scripture and say, you know, it doesn't really matter what I do. God loves us and let love have its way. And you can live any way you want to. You can live a perverted, immoral, ungodly life and because you are convinced that's the way God made you and he loves me. So, yeah, he, his grace is sufficient to cover all my sins. The Bible says, God forbid. And the thing is, if a person really loves God, they will, you will, I will obey him. Obey him. Amen? Give you an example. Take a, a life that is messed up. Take a family situation that's totally dysfunctional. You could probably go anywhere in the Bible and find an example. Jacob. His life was a mess. Before his name became Israel, and Israel means a man who has prevailed with mankind and God, and God has favored and blessed him. His name meant supplanter. When he was living at home with Isaac, Rebecca, and his brother Esau was there, he was in the flesh. 
he caused such a problem because he stole his brother's inheritance spiritually, the blessing of his dad. His mother was involved in it and said, I want you to deceive your dad. You know, go out there and here's this uh, meat offering, this sacrifice, the, your dad's favorite portion of meat, and you disguise yourself and put a lot of hair on you and all that. So you'll look like Esau, and he did that. When Esau found it out, found out what happened, he said, I'm going to kill my brother. Now, this is the family that God called and chose. And you know what happened? Jacob had to flee. He left his house, his family, and went up to live with his uncle Laban and had nothing. He got there, and what he did, what he measured out came measuring back to him. He fell in love with Rachel, and so he made a deal with his, her dad, Haran, and said, I'll serve you seven years. He did. And so his wedding night sends Rachel into his tent where he consummates this marriage relationship. And he sends Leah. And it said that she nickname was Cowide. He woke up. I guess he drank a little bit too much wine. Another problem. And he goes, oh, oh, what? who is this? This is not Rachel. This is Leah. And uh, Laban says, well, it's not our custom and our tradition to give uh, the second born. You got to give the first born first. He said, I'll never get another uh, seven more years. You can have Rachel too. I mean, you know, there's a deception going on and all kinds of crazy stuff. And now he's got two wives, you know, two women in the kitchen. That's not going to work. Not going to work. And he had more than two wives. I mean, in this problem here, I mean, here's God trying to work together for good to those who love God. And then you know what? You look, you, you read the whole life of Jacob and just one mess after another, totally dysfunctional. His oldest son, Reuben, has sexual relationships with one of his wives, Bildad. And then look at one of his favorite sons. He had a favorite. You don't do that. You don't say to your kids, uh, so-and-so is my favorite. The rest of you, you know, I love you, but you're down here somewhere. He had favorites. Joseph was his favorite. And look at all the problems there in the life of Joseph. Here's a family that is messed up. And you know what? All things work together for good to those who love God, called according to God's purpose. You know what? God had the last word because he straightened out every one of those messes and brought a good thing in the life of Jacob. Out of Jacob, his 12 sons, comes the 12 tribes of Israel. God's covenant with them. Even when you, in your family, you look at things and you're praying, God, I got all my ducks in a row. Everything is working out. You tell me in the scriptures, all things work together for good to those who love God. I love God and called according to his purposes. You see, God's going to work out things in your family according to his purpose, not your purpose. And I've had to repent and say, God, I tried to get into the arm of flesh and make things work together for good. And the more I involve myself, the worse it got. When I got back, stepped back and said, Lord, I trust you. I take my hands off my kids. I take my hands off my grandkids. I'm going to get out of the way because I've gotten away too many times. I got out of the way. Finally, things begin to work out for good and not bad. Don't give up if you're in the midst of a mess because God's word is true. All things will work together for good to those who love God. Do you love God? Amen. It will work out 
Don't mess up by getting in there and trying to be God. Let God be God. Amen? Now, my mom and dad raised four kids. I'm the oldest, then Carolyn, Sheila, and Dan. You know what? It all worked out for good. My mom and dad are in the presence of Jesus. All of us know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we married our spouses to be, and they all know Jesus. And let me tell you, there's some bad things that happen in our family, particularly with me, more so than with Sheila. Sheila was good, Dan was good, Carol was, I was bad. I did some things that I don't want you to know about, and you have too. We all have sinned. We're all broken. We're all messed up. The best thing ever happened to me, happened to you, was God chose you, called you, is working in your life. And I want to say, along with this journey, that God at that right time, grabbed a hold of me and said, your life does not belong to you. You're bought with a price. Quit wrestling with God. Jacob, quit wrestling with God. Let go. He finally did. That was a turning point in his life. So I've got some good news for you. Continue to pray, believe God, call in the name of the Lord Jesus for your husband, your wife, your children, maybe extended member of your family, or a friend. Never, 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 never give up. God is sovereign. He's in control. And if you love God and you yield to God, he will work it out. Every one of those people called of God along the way messed up, lied. Abraham lied a couple times, did some deceiving things. Isaac did. Jacob did. Many of the prophets did. Many of the kings did. But God's purposes were accomplished. Amen? Sometimes it takes a little bit longer. I think the reason it takes a little bit longer is because we keep getting in the way. Step out of the way. One of the hardest things for me was to let my girls, let them go into the hands of God. I would say, Lord, I give them to you. And then they start doing something stupid or a boy I didn't like coming in their life. I said, I'm going to take care of him. I live my life, but he hasn't. And you want to go see Jesus right now or someone else? And the more I pushed, the further away they went. So I backed off said, all right, Lord, you take care of it. He calls me from the state of California. I'm going to say, how are you doing? Have a nice day. I got out of the way. God got in the way. And all things work together for good. Those who love God are called according to not your purpose, but God's purpose. Amen? How many have some prayer requests pertaining to that? Amen. I got some right now. I got some family members that are not walking in the way. They're out of the way. They're adrift on the ocean. Up and down. But I know that I have a God who through the power of the Holy Spirit, at some point in time, they laid their head down on the pillow at night. And God can deal with them through a dream, a vision, and deal with their conscience and grab a hold of them and just put the squeeze on them. And they come to Jesus. Amen? Check this out. The Spirit of God is conforming us to be like Jesus. Now, there's a word in there. It talks about the foreknowledge of God. According to God's foreknowledge, he has predestined us. They go, oh, oh, no. God has predetermined that we will be conformed on the image of the Son. I thank God for predestination. 
If you ask me, Pastor Baker, are you a Calvinist or are you Arminianist? I'm a Calvinist. Do you know why? I think there's a balance between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, and they work together. It's a mystery, but it works. Here's the ultimate purpose for the believer. Not to fulfill the Great Commission, which is important, to take the gospel in all the world. Amen. But God's ultimate purpose for you is not to become a flaming evangelist. His ultimate purpose for you is that you would be like Jesus. That you would be like, so he has predetermined because you said, I give my life to you. So what he's going to do, this process of sanctification is to work in your life that you take on more of the character and nature of Jesus Christ. He is the potter, it says in Romans 8. We're the clay. So he'll take you and you say, it's not my life, it's your life. God, work your good will and purpose in my life. He takes you and he starts to squeeze you. He might use your spouse. He might use another family member. He might use an employer. He might use a staff sergeant. In my life, in the military, I had a sergeant. I went to the chaplain. I said, you need to put a hit man on him. And that sergeant was an instrument of God. I didn't know at the time. He was using this man to bring me into that place of conformity with the plan and purpose of God in my life. I didn't know at the time. I thought, this guy is full of the devil. I come to realize that God has predetermined and he cares and loves for us. And so what he's doing, he's taking this hunk of clay and through life circumstances and situations, he begins to mold us and conform us. And so more of the old fleshly carnal nature falls away. We become more like Jesus. More kind, more patient, more loving, more thoughtful, more like Jesus. And let me tell you, I've still got a lot of room for improvement. And one of the main instruments in my life for getting me to stay in the straight and narrow, God has given me a helpmate who sometimes she'll say, <clears throat> um, you could have done that a little bit better. You need to close your mouth. I go, ooh. You. I think of Jackie Gleason and the Honeymooners. Alice, one of these days, bang, zoom, right to the moon. And then I had to come to the conclusion, all right, Lord, forgive me. And I'm sure that happens with her, how God will use me to straighten her out. And uh, marriage... You get longevity in marriage by being two good forgivers. Amen? Not letting your wrath go down and hold on to it overnight, but just walk with Jesus. I look at the life of my mom, and you just see the sweetness of God in her life. And uh, just see that how God had worked in her life when she, as a young girl, met my dad and married, he took her from the deep south up to the heathen part of New York. Not that New York was bad, but she was totally removed from her family, and God brought a wonderful Christian woman who was like a mother to her, Hazel Battles, into her life. I remember I named Hazel Battles Big Ma. I remember as a kid going to her house and she had this big basket of candy bars she kept in there. She sold candy to the neighborhood kids. I come in there and said, surely I'm her favorite. Where's the candy? She said, you get one small Hershey bar. That's it. I said, ooh, come on. I want to just get in there and indulge myself. Big Ma wouldn't let you do that. I remember one time she took soap she wasn't even blood to wash my mouth out because I, I said something bad. Probably poo-poo, something like that, you know. 
And so, I mean, I had to work out for something good. I mean, Big Mile, Sergeant Gaither, God, why, you know? But see, don't worry about getting concerned about predestination. God has predetermined that you're going to be like Jesus. Is that good news? Huh? In this life, when you step in there, you see him as he is, and you will be like him. God's, you're God's work in progress. God's workmanship. That's good. That's a good thing. And you know what? People get hung up on this predestination. I mean, God knew that I was going to do this, this, and this was going to happen, and he predetermined all these things for my life, and I didn't have any choice in the matter. Listen, the most important thing that ever happens in your life is not where you work, not so much who you marry, not so much where you live, how much money you have, or you this. I make choices every day, and I don't, I don't have to pray about getting up in the morning. I don't have to pray about getting dressed or brush my teeth. Gives you a good sound mind. The most important thing that you need in your life, that everybody needs, I need, is salvation. I can't save myself. You can't save yourself. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. It's the goodness of God who the power of the Holy Spirit calls you, predetermines that you will be conformed to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a person who doesn't know God doesn't really care. Doesn't care. Doesn't realize. And they can hear the gospel time and time again, and they keep doing this. They keep doing this. God knows because he has foreknowledge. He knows who's going to have been. I don't know that. You don't know that. But I want to say, thank God, the thing I couldn't do for myself, he did for me. He saved me. He saved you. He called you. He justified you. And he will glorify you. He has a plan for your life. You know what? It will work together for good. It will. Amen? And the last thing, the Spirit of God will bring completion and glorification in our lives at the end of time. Now, in the scripture, just a few verses before this, he tells us, if you're going to follow Jesus, you will suffer. There will be people in your family who don't understand your walk with Christ, who don't understand that you have a worldview based on the word of God. That's why we don't embrace abortion. We don't embrace abnormal civil unions. That's why we don't embrace lying and killing and cheating and bad-mouthing. There's a lot of things that the Word of God says no to, and those things are parameters for us to be protected and have the best in our lives. One of the greatest testimonies I think I have in my life is when I take my last breath and step in eternity that my family, my friends, my church will say, Pastor Baker was a man of God with integrity and loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can attest to the fact that God loved him and cared for him and used him to be a testimony. You see, you and me, we want to finish life well. We can have the testimony that Paul had in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 7 and 8. I fought a good fight. I finished what God called me to do. I kept the faith. And there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And for all those who believe and follow the same example, I want to, you want to finish life well. Amen. And so, if you follow Jesus, he says in these few verses just before this passage of Scripture read today, that you will suffer. Because you identify with Christ. Because you have light in you. And when you come into a place where there's darkness. Where people live in darkness. Your life 
will expose their evil deeds. John chapter 3. Just by the way you live, the way you, I think yours a Bible thumping goody two shoes. It just irritates me. Sometimes I won't even say that. But because you take a stand for God, particularly in our day, our nation is getting darker and darker because it's chosen not to follow Jesus. And Christianity, unfortunately, is on the decline. Not that God has lost the battle. He will win, but you will be a bright light. Amen? You come into a situation, and you say, I want to give God all the glory. I want to thank Jesus. He's my life. I remember up in New York, I was fishing out in a remote area. Wasn't planning to do any evangelism, talk to anyone about Jesus. I went to go fishing. And I caught a nine-pound, six-ounce rainbow trout. The blessings of God. He addeth no sorrow to it. And there happened to be a guy out there working on this cabin out in the middle of the boondocks. And he goes, oh, my goodness. He come running over. I didn't think there was anything in there that big. I said, sir, this is the blessings of God. What? The blessings of God. You had a secret lure. Ain't no blessings of God. Yeah, this is the blessings of God. I asked him to help me. You know what happened? There was a conversation that started. When I left that piece of property the other day, that young man became a believer in Jesus Christ. Light dispels darkness, and a choice has to come about. Amen? And so, the things that we suffer in this life and the pains that we have, everyone here can't be sheltered from heartbreak and disappointment and pain and suffering. Well, be like a pinprick when you step in eternity and you see the glory of God. And what he has for plan for you and me, we cannot fully humanly comprehend what God has. And those unfortunate things where you had... Your children say, I hate you. Stay out of my life. Or you've been betrayed, backstabbed, taken advantage of at work, at home, or wherever. Those things compared with the glory that God has for you is like a pinprick and it's over when you step in there and you see that God did orchestrate your life and the best is yet to come. You will be glorified. You will have a body that is not old and decrepit. You won't be going around like this. You will be up there and you will look good. Amen? God has all good-looking children. Brilliant children. You won't be using only 10% of your brain. You'll be using 100%. You will be a by a kappa beta. Is that right? What is it? The Greek word for being smart. Amen? I want to read in closing a poem. The workmanship of God. I am the workmanship of God. He's conforming me to his image. Christ has become my righteousness. His presence transformed my visage. He whom the Son of God sets free, God declares, is now free indeed. I've been bought with a great price. I'm destined to become God's seed. I won't question the will of God. I will seek to walk in his ways. I will trust in the King of kings, and I'll serve him all my days. Copyrighted 1999 by Diana J. Baker. Amen. God's workmanship. God got you in the palm of your hand. You know, here's the good news. You're going to work out. Here's what God says. He's the one that started this work in you, and he's going to bring it to fruition. Praise God. Here's what he says in the next verse. If God is for you, who can be against you? Huh? Now, you're going to have some rough days ahead. I am. Do you know what? God's got you. And if we mess up, he'll re- bring repentance, and you'll correct it. You'll make it right. And you'll go on, and you will be a blessing. 
God will bless you and you'll be a blessing. Can you say amen? Please stand.